you. Oh, let's try that again. Hello, my name is Andre Pruitt. I am a doctoral student and or at Oregon at Portland State University. I'm also a Oregon Health Science University Research Net Network Scholar. Today and the help today this um, seminar is put together by the Healthy Brain Research Network, also known as HBRN, which was created by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2014 to address a pair of growing public health challenges, promoting cognitive health and addressing the needs of increasing numbers of older Americans living with cognitive impairment, building public health workforce capacity, and the HRBN Scholar Program is part of delivering on the broader mission of the Healthy Brain Research Network. Once again, welcome to the innovative and interdisciplinary careers in aging and the Healthy Brain Research Network Scholar webinar. We have three presenters today who will have 10 minutes to speak and at the very end of our session, we will be having questions and answering. Okay. So to begin our talk, the three, um, Presenters are Cameron Camp, who is the Director of Research in the Development Center for Applied Research in Dementia. We have Teresa Arnold, who is with the State Director of Legislator and Director of ARP. And we have Liz Nielsen, who is um, Division of Behavioral and Social Research, National Institute on Aging, and the National Institute of Health. We will begin our se seminar with, oh, Look at this. We have a little slider. So submit your questions via the chat box and direct to everyone during the session. There'll be a 20 minute moderated question answer that will occur at the end of the three presentations. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available to all registrants at the end. Okay. Dr. Cameron Camp will be speaking about translation of research and dissemination of innovation, a tale of misspent youth and middle age catharsis. Welcome, Cameron Camp. Thank you so much. Um, I've been asked to summarize a 40 year career in 10 minutes, so that'll be a year every 15 seconds. I'll do the best that I can. Uh, next slide. So this is like a very quick autobiography. So this first step in the career, and I'm speaking especially to the students and the postdocs here uh, who are um, attending. Uh, you know, you have to get the doctorate. I would advise that you not be a clone of your advisor. Um, it helps if you have flexibility in terms of where you're going with your career. Remember that the PhD is a half-life. You'll forget half of what you uh, learn uh, every five years or so. But uh, the other thing is, will it be relevant in 20 years? And so maybe the world will be forgetting uh, what you've learned or at least not finding it useful. Uh, and as a result, you need to be able to make sure that you're going to be flexible, that you have the capacity to uh, shift. Uh, another piece of advice my advisor gave me was to find powerful, a powerful effect and run with it. I've been fortunate to find a couple of those. Next slide. So step two, you have to get a job. Remember that the doctorate only opens the door. Uh, the job is what you're going to make of it. Uh, you have to be open to discovery. Uh, in my particular case, I started working uh, with uh, uh, older adults who were without cognitive deficits, and I've uh, worked all the way to working with people with advanced dementia over the course of my career. So uh, the other piece of advice is you have to be willing to reinvent yourself probably multiple times. Uh, that's very important. You just have to be able to be flexible. Millennials get this, other people don't. Next slide. Um, the third step for me was uh, leaving uh, academia. Um, I had a colleague who worked in a rat lab and he was allergic to rats and he wore a gas mask to go to work in the labs. And I asked him why he did this and he said, because it's the only thing that I know how to do. So uh, don't be like that. Uh, um, academia can give you disillusionment if uh, you go in uh, uh, too idealistically. You have to remember it's a human institution. Uh, you also have to ask yourself at some point, at what point uh, do you see publication in academic journal as having impact on the lives of ordinary people? I know that uh, Neil Charnas gave a presentation at the time on uh, the impact of various uh, things on the way people's lives are changed and academic publications were pretty low on the list. 
Uh, that's just the way the world is. Kissinger may have been right. Uh, he said, uh, the trouble with academics is they often play for small stakes. So I'm not always loved there, but you know, I walked away from a tenured uh, full professorship, so at least I have some street credit in that regard. Uh, next slide. So for me, I wanted to uh, conduct truly applied research. Um, it's important to remember that if you're looking at how to enable a person with dementia to not break their hip when they sit down, this is a big thing. Um, being able to uh, uh, enable that person not to break their hip when they sit means that uh, they're likely uh, uh, to survive. A broken hip for someone over the age of 85 has a more than 50% mortality risk. Uh, I've done some work with a technique called spaced retrieval, which enables persons with dementia and other cognitive impairments, stroke, TBI, to learn and remember new information. And when I first heard about it, I heard the angels singing. I saw this was one of those powerful effects that's good to run with. Uh, another is uh, the work of Maria Montessori and translating that into work with persons uh, with dementia, uh, a woman who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. So if you're Going to follow a leader, pick a good one. And finally, you know, a real key is to remember that our, our goal, if we're going to be translating research into practice, is to ultimately make ourselves unnecessary. We need to be able to train, teach people so that uh, they can do this stuff without us. Uh, next slide, please. So how to truly help people. Uh, we have a a person we think of as an archetype, uh, her name is Sarah. She lives in Pocatello, Idaho. She has uh, a moderate dementia, arthritis. Uh, and um, the question is, how will we be able to help Sarah if we never meet her or the people that uh, she works with? Uh, what is it that people really need? What is it that they want? And usually it's something that comes out of a box uh, that they can immediately put to use and that is absolutely and wildly intuitive. Uh, if we can't provide that, then no matter how beautiful the complex thing we deliver to them is, it will simply not be used and not be useful and wind up on a shelf. And so uh, we need to realize that if we're going to be into the world of dissemination to help people on a large scale, we need to involve the people who are not us uh, uh, in the process. Next slide. So... What are some things that you really need to know? Uh, all the things I wish I had learned back in the day were things like uh, uh, how to put together a budget, how to run spreadsheets, how to deal with contracts. Uh, uh, the work of Donald Berwick is very important if you're interested in looking at dissemination research, uh, how to be able to deal with patents and getting one, trademarks, what a copyright is and what a copyright isn't. You will need to invest in accountants and lawyers if you wish to be uh, able to be effective in impacting people's lives. Uh, and if you also wish not to see ideas that you have and things you've created uh, taken out of your control. Uh, none of these things are generally taught in graduate programs, uh, but I can tell you, for example, that Yiska Cohen Mansfield, who has an assessment tool named after her that's used around the world, went back to get an MBA. Uh, because uh, she's very invested in applied research and uh, impacting people's lives. So again, the, the doctorate it opens the door for you to begin to learn what you need to know. What that is, you'll find out after you get there. Next slide. Let's see. So you have to make the right friends and the right enemies. It's very important to find right thinking competent people that you can work with. Uh, this is critical, and there aren't that many of them out there in the world. And so the idea is that you need to be able to combine forces with and be inspired by people who think along the lines that you do and are able to uh, work in the world. We have a saying wherever I've been, and that is it's not enough to be right, we must be effective. Um, you can have a beautiful uh, publication and it may never uh, actually impact the lives of uh, people in Pocatello, Idaho. So uh, that means that you have to learn a lot of stuff by talking to people in the trenches as opposed to what you read in books. I also realize that you can't please everyone, which is a very good thing. There are some people who will always 
disagree with you. Um, that's not a bad thing if you're right. And so uh, uh, you have to live with that. You cannot please everyone. You have to learn how to say no. Uh, you have a limited amount of time uh, on this earth, a limited amount of resources. You have to realize every decision that you make to do something means you'll not be able to do something else. Every decision that you make has consequences, some intended, some unintended. And so uh, you have to be able to learn to live with that. And you'll never be able to get everything done that you wish to. So uh, pick your fights, prioritize. Next slide. It's important to think in terms of having a, a mission rather than a career. You know, what is, what is your mission uh, on this particular planet? Why is it that you want at the end of the day to leave as a legacy? Uh, what is it that you want to be able to look back at the end of a career and say, you know, this is, this is what uh, I've done to make the world a better place. Uh, it's not about making money. Uh, it's not about publishing. You know, after the first, you know, 50 publications, from there on, you're just keeping score. Uh, it's not about promotion. I know a lot of people who were tenured and uh, hated to go to work. Um, uh, hated students and they were hanging uh, on just to be able to uh, uh, finish and retire. So what's it all for? Uh, you have to organize your life around making uh, life better for everyone. You have to think uh, in terms of being able to influence people for the better and and realize that everything else uh, out there is just whistles and bells. I mean, this sounds kind of preachy, but uh, you know, looking back after 40 years of a career, that's really what this is all about. And that's the message I would especially send out again to students and those who are just beginning their career. Okay. And then next slide, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And now we are moving on to the next presenter. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, I just jumped in front of you. This is Teresa. On. <laughs> <laughs> go right ahead. Thank you for taking the lead. You go right ahead. <laughs> you know, that actually is a characteristic of mine. I'm very impatient and I jump to and leap to things. So I just did it again. That's okay. Uh, completely <laughs> true to character. So I uh, am the state director for AARP. I've been with AARP for about 15 years. And um, it's been a tremendously powerful journey for me. And I would love to share with you how I got from there to here. And next slide. So you can see um, I am on the far right as I'm looking at the screen, the tallest uh, goofy kid there. I'm five, nine, I'm gonna grow another inch and a half. I'm only 13 and I was babysitting already until the woman found out that I was not 16 and she fired me. So that was the first time I got fired. Next slide. So one of the things um, I started working when I was 15, I just wanted to let you know that pretty much everything you do, everything you do feeds the career path. And when I worked at Dairy Queen, I learned things, a newspaper complaint department, Sears, Allstate. And in fact, as I say on here, denying insurance claims when I was only 21 years old was definitely a learning uh, opportunity for me and it also taught me to be a little bit tougher because there were a few people that yelled at us when you were at Allstate. Um, but it also taught me how to continually uh, react to others in a way that's positive and moves the process forward instead of getting bogged down in negative issues. Next slide. So one of the first things that I learned is that Volunteering is a really good path to learning what your passion is and also can be a connection to employment. Um, and an example of that for me was the fact that um, when I was in college, I uh, was stunned to become one of the victims of domestic violence or abuse from my loved one. Uh, I was not used to that and it was a real a turning point in my life and looking back it's something that I don't regret at all because it did affect the trajectory of my life. I ended up working at a shelter as a volunteer, a shelter for abused women 
and from that became volunteer coordinator when a position came open at the shelter. One of the best jobs I've ever had. And again, I learned so much when I was there. So I encourage people to volunteer. One of the things that I have heard actually even just this week is that we are more effective in our careers when we're authentic. And authenticity comes from our own experience and what makes us passionate. Next slide. So uh, I want to definitely talk about failure. Um, just uh, as an example, right after I got my master's in social work, and by the way, my master's in social work, I got an advocacy, policy making, grassroots organizing, um, that whole arena of administration management, making a difference on a systems level because I didn't feel qualified to be a clinical social worker. I, I, I was a little intimidated by that. Um, and so my first job, um, I got my foot in the door, uh, which is really important. I was not making much. I, I put up there that settling for less. My first job out of um, graduate school, I was making 19000 with no benefits. So literally probably making less than I had been when I went into graduate school, but it got my foot in the door. And uh, a, a permanent position came open within this uh, organization that was with, worked in conjunction with the legislature here in South Carolina, and I applied for it and was turned down. And so I was um, terrifically disappointed, but I determined that I would just work that much harder in this position. And within a couple of three weeks, the person who was supposed to get the job had to withdraw her name. And I was given the job. So it was a real eye opener to me. Had I pouted or pulled away, it would have been a problem. So uh, I always think of failure is not the opposite of success. It is part of success. And that is not my uh, language. I think that came off of a, a Hallmark card, but I really liked it. Um, always be willing to move on. Uh, one of the things that I learned over the years is that if I see that, I, you know, if you apply for something, and this is another issue, but I also was in a position where I was expecting to be promoted and was not. And so that freed me up to look elsewhere. So never feel compelled to stay within one organization when you believe that you may be of more value somewhere else. It's, it's, to me, it's just an, it's an opportunity. It's not a drawback. And um, one other thing I learned over the years, because I did not have experience in the direct social social work field. And I was doing uh, planning for, I had about a million dollar budget for training for nonprofits all over the state of South Carolina, but I felt like I didn't really have a background to make the best decision. So my husband and I became house parents at a shelter for abused children. We did it off and on as both paid staff and volunteers for about 10 years. And it really helped in form how I made decisions going forward. So I, I always think you should be really open to unusual ways to get additional experience. Next slide. Um, and the next slide would be, uh, that's backwards. Okay, there you go. Mentors and relationships. And of course, I already are, am seeing parallels between my presentation and the Cameron's presentation. But it is really true that many of my jobs came from, uh, uh, from knowing other people. And it's really important for you to get out there and to be available and in the field. Um, my first job I got through another uh, co-student who I had gone to school with and she learned about it and she helped me get that one. I've learned about jobs from other employees, other colleagues. Um, my first field supervisor, I ended up going back to work for him many years later. Um, so it's always, you just never know where these uh, connections are gonna make a difference. And I always feel like in order for people to know who you are, you need to step up and speak out. You need to make a difference and always work really hard. Next slide. Um, I want to, I'm bringing you forward across the arc of my career. Um, one of the things that I ended up doing uh, was working for Ways and Means 
And for those of you who are not familiar with um, state legislatures, the Ways and Means Committee does the budget for states. And so I was a budget analyst, which was a very unusual career path for a social worker. But my argument would be that social workers should be doing things at the state house. We should be involved in policy and advocacy, and we should definitely be making relationships with legislators because if they don't hear from us, they're not going to understand about where we're coming from in terms of how can we impact populations and folks in a positive manner that can be beneficial for the, for the state as well. I know the first time I got my job at Ways and Means, um, it was when in South Carolina, the House of Representatives had flipped to Republican. And so when I met all of these newly minted Republican chairs of their subcommittees, I was very proud to tell them that I had a master's in social work and I had a social work background. And, um, and I smiled real big at this room of uh, Republican men. And um, basically they, uh, looked at me and it was complete dead silence. And I learned later that they all, were all looking at me thinking, she's a flaming liberal. So, but on the other hand, they really came to value my skills and abilities and my abilities to work with their constituents. So those are um, something I, I very much cherish the experience I had there, but I also learned to move on from that. Um, so, after Ways and Means, I ended up becoming the Director of Governmental Affairs for the uh, Department of Social Services, which is very different. So I was advocating for all of the populations that social services uh, works with. So that's abused children and uh, abused adults, neglected adults, uh, folks on TANF, um, child support. So you name it, that I had a hand in working to either improve or change laws or try to get additional funding for those populations. And um, one of the things that happened while I was there, and this is my key story about passion and how you can make a difference wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I had a young uh, man come to me while I was at the Department of Social Services and he indicated that, he said he was aging out of foster care. And I had worked on getting him in-state uh, tuition status in South Carolina. So he came to me and he wanted to make some changes in the, um, at the state house. He wanted to get tuition exempted for um, kids who age out of foster care. So he wants statewide, all the colleges and technical schools to exempt tuition for foster kids if they age out of foster care, which made perfect sense to me. So we worked him all the way through the process. We had him do the research, do the pros and cons, pull together an advocacy group, do some grassroots work. So, so he ended up, um, and we have, I hear some whispering in the background. So, sorry to interrupt you, but your time is up. Oh, my time is up. Yes. Well, let me just say, I should have talked. <laughs> I'm chairing the Alliance for a Healthier South Carolina. If you have any questions about that or global brain work, you just asked me after this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so now we're going on to our final presenter, Liz Nelson, who is the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, National Institute on Aging, National Institute of Health. Welcome, Liz. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, it's good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a branch chief here in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, which is one of the four extramural research divisions at the NIA, uh, where I have the privilege of working to develop innovative research programs on aging in the behavioral and social sciences. Next slide, please. So the question is, uh, how did I get here? Um, um, I didn't really start out in aging research. If you could put the next slide up, please, that'd be great. Um, I didn't really start out in aging research, and I'm not actually sure if I ever ended up in aging research either. My undergraduate degree at Rhodes College was in philosophy, which was followed by a couple of years of grad studies in applied ethics at the University of Colorado in Boulder, before I realized that a career in philosophy was probably not the most promising or lucrative path, but where I did have some fabulous introduction to cognitive science that sparked my interest in psychology. And I could insert 
probably a few major detours on the road here, but I'm just going straight to my next academic stop in Copenhagen, um, which is not far from where I was born. I returned to Denmark for seven years and uh, received a BA and an MA in psychology from the University of Copenhagen. And while I was there, I helped to start a student symposium series for experimental psychology together with a couple of my fellow students, which tapped into a, a training need that was felt by many students in the department that were interested in taking a research path. Uh, and I kind of see some early roots of the work I do now back at that in that experience. Um, while I was in Denmark, I also met a mathematics professor from Arizona who was working in tr the transdisciplinary field of consciousness studies. Um, and he connected me with the Consciousness Studies Center at the University of Arizona. So after completing my degree in Denmark, I went to Arizona to pursue my PhD in psychology and cognitive science there, where I was able to combine my interests in philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience to study conscious emotion experience. Um, this experience was followed by an NIA-funded postdoc at Stanford prior to coming to NIA in Bethesda in 2005, and I'll say a bit more about that on the next slide, where um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my key mentors on this path. Um, one of them was Al Kazniak, who directed the Emotion and Memory Lab and the Center for Consciousness Studies at the U of A. Um, Al was an incredible synthesizer of ideas and deeply interested in topics spanning the study of emotion and the study of consciousness. Um, I collaborated with him, um, putting together several interdisciplinary workshops on these themes. And then through Al, I was introduced to Laura Carstensen, who's a well-known aging researcher at Stanford, whose work focuses on emotional aging. And subsequently then, I went to Palo Alto to work with her and Brian Knudsen, who is a leading neuroeconomist and affective neuroscientist on topics at the intersection of those three fields. Um, while I was at Stanford after a couple of years, it turned out that NIA was recruiting for a program officer. And based on a very minimal conversation about NIA careers, and I'd never thought about it much, Laura ended up recommending me to Sid Stahl, uh, who was the current branch chief in my position. And from him, I quickly got to know what the job entailed and really rushed to pull together an application. Um, because if you don't know it, federal jobs are only ever announced for two weeks, uh, and there's no exception to those deadlines. So I you know, this was nothing I had really considered before, but uh, I threw myself into that process. And I must say with uh, tremendous support from Al Kazniak, who I reached out to, who quieted my uncertainty by sharing insights from his own very nonlinear career path. Um, Richard Sisman, who's pictured up on the, the top of the slide, was then the director here at BSR, and he was particularly keen on some of the interdisciplinary fields I was working in, including neuroeconomics. And I had conversations with several outside investigators who told me how innovative the environment was in BSR under Richard's leadership. And to make a long story short, I was offered the job on the same day that my husband was let go in a downsizing of the Bay Area startup where he was working. So we just basically decided to head east without giving it a second thought. Uh, the thought of living in Palo Alto, California on a postdoc salary just with a new baby just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. So next slide, please. So I joined uh, BSR as a program officer in 2005, and the current staff in our division are shown here. Uh, it's missing both Richard, who passed away a few years ago, and Sid Stahl, who was my branch chief and a tremendously supportive mentor on my path to becoming a seasoned program official at NIH. Well, I just wanted to show this to you so that you can see what an interdisciplinary environment uh, I'm working in, which spans multiple behavioral, psychological, economic, and social science discipline. A really talented group of colleagues, and each of us is really responsible for developing distinct but often intersecting areas of science. Next slide, please. So in addition uh, to being very interdisciplinary, our, a lot of our focus in BSR is really transdisciplinary. We're working to try to advance science that fully integrates insights from multiple disciplines to address major public health challenges facing the aging population. And our position brings us into contact directly with many leaders of the field, including members of our advisory council, expert consultants at our workshops, and of course our grantees. 
It's also a job that has nice benefits and job security. So unlike many of you, uh, we don't have to worry about where the next grant is coming from, which is in some ways very intellectually freeing. Um, so working at NIA, also you have the opportunity to take a little bit of a broader perspective, which can be contrasted with um, the scientific specialization you might be doing in your PhD or in an early faculty uh, career. So you're not a specialist in a particular area, which is, I think, great for somebody like me who's always been interested in emerging areas where new ideas are being generated. And it's a terrific learning opportunity for growing the breadth of your knowledge. Uh, when, you know, we re interview people often for jobs at NIA, and when I'm asked to describe what I do all day, I often say it's a third mentoring of applicants and grantees about NIA opportunities, policies, and feedback on their grant ideas, a third bureaucracy that is a lot of internal reporting to the Institute and doing the work that supports our three annual funding cycles, and then a third science development, uh, which is really my favorite part, you know, which involves developing new scientific initiatives, typically through activities involving experts from across the aging field and beyond. Next slide, please. So, so what is the science that we support? Um, one of the things I've really liked about NIA is that it's traditionally been a life course rather than a disease-focused institute. And so while we do support studies of aging-related diseases, a lot of what we fund is on understanding variation and normative processes of aging as they unfold over the full life course trying to understand what factors account for variation in aging trajectories. What makes the difference between premature aging and successful aging and everything in between? So our portfolio of research is rich in biobehavioral and biosocial integration, and it also uh, integrates basic and applied science to advance what we call a mechanisms-focused uh, approach to intervention science that's intended to promote positive aging trajectories, but also support adaptive aging for older adults with or without disease, always with an eye to real world implementability from the very get go of, of this kind of research. Next slide, please. So in broad strokes, what we try to promote are initiatives that address fundamental challenges in the social and behavioral sciences, namely elucidating the pathways by which social, psychological, economic, and behavioral factors affect health in later life, identifying the causal mechanisms that account for observed associations and variation, and targeting those mechanisms to modify both individual behaviors and social contexts to promote health and prevent disease. So the question is, how do we do that? Uh, next slide, please. So we do it basically by encouraging research. One way is by supporting investments in data infrastructure that allow other investigators to do this work. So we support a lot of large longitudinal studies on aging, which are some of the world's richest scientific resources for information on processes of aging at both the individual and the societal level. Next slide, please. But often, uh, the work that's required to address these questions re requires the engagement of in investigators across a lot of disciplines. In some cases, it requires new conceptual frameworks or methodological advances. The one thing we've been doing since 2009 is supporting these high priority behavioral and social research networks to stimulate new science in key areas, support investigators to push some boundaries in our field, and importantly, to attract new investigators to aging research. Next slide, please. So just some examples of networks that have been making some real inroads in addressing major challenges facing our fields include a stress measurement network that's linking population and laboratory science and studying stress health relationships, a reversibility network that's looking at whether we can reverse in midlife the disease liability that's associated with early life adversity, a trans-NIH science of behavior change network trying to transform behavior change research through a focus on mechanisms of change, and an open science network that's trying to shift incentives in our field so that the core value of rec replicability is rewarded in aging research and in social sciences research more generally. Next slide, please. So in my final minute, um, I just want to say a couple words about how we are working in our team to grow uh, behavioral and social research investments in Alzheimer's disease. Um, obviously, uh, the number of people with AD in the population is growing rapidly, and a lot of the challenges with this increasing disease burden are behavioral, psychological, or social in nature. 
So in our division over the last few years, as our budget for Alzheimer's research has ballooned, we've been putting a lot of creative energy into developing initiatives in multiple areas of our science to try to attract strong behavioral social sciences to the field. Um, and you can see uh, here in this color wheel the number of areas where we're putting a lot of our energy. Um, it's It's been sort of a, a creative rush in some sense, but also an incredible opportunity to grow the pie of what um, out, what constitutes Alzheimer's research and also um, think about leveraging some of the really exciting research we've already been developing in our portfolios and trying to push uh, it to be applicable uh, to the Alzheimer's field. Um, so that's been something that occupies quite a lot of our time, but through the same sort of, of activities that I described before. So let's just go to my last slide, um, which just to sort of summarize and say that uh, working at NIA has really expanded and in some ways shifted the scientific directions I've taken. It's allowed me to build on areas of early interest and work to expand the aging focus in emerging fields like neuroeconomics or social and affective neuroscience. But it's also turned me toward more health-related fields, to more translational research, and to some new, for me, exciting areas where the psychological population and economic sciences are intersecting to suggest novel solutions to the challenges of aging. And, you know, I have to say, I couldn't have charted out the path to all of these topics at the beginning. I'm not sure which topics will be next, um, but the kind of work we do has never a dull moment. Uh, and it's really been a privilege to serve in this position for the last 14 years. I would say that, that being a, a program official, certainly where I am situated at NIH, is a great way to have a research career, but a non-traditional research path. I would say I've learned more here than ever in any earlier phase of my um, academic career, and the learning continues constantly, which is a really nice benefit of um, working with talented colleagues and, and getting great access to uh, the, the emerging trends in science. Thank you. Thank you very much um, from Cameron and Teresa and Liz for your presentation. And now we're moving on to some questions and answering section of our talk. Just to remind people that if you have questions, you can also put them onto the chat. I have two right here. Um, so I'm going to read first. One came from Rachel, and she's about to finish her PhD in public health and applying for both faculty and post doctorate positions. She recently heard that she should prioritize postdoc even if if she had faculty job if she had a faculty job because she would be more successful in getting a K award or I series grants if I have if she had a doctorate on her CV. Could Cameron and Liz weigh in on this? Liz? Well, I can say that yeah, first for a K, for a K award, you have to be a faculty member somewhere. Um, but it, they're very competitive uh, in the sense that, um, you know, funding lines tend to be pretty tight for career awards. So if you don't already have a strong um, record, research record, publication record um, to show that you're worthy of that investment in the, in the career development that's going to take you in a sort of a new direction, um, a period of postdoc might be a good idea or, or some other activity where you're, you're gaining that, um, those credentials, because it is a competitive uh, process for career. But you have to be a faculty member to get a K, so there's that issue about it as well. I, I wouldn't say that there's anything necessarily that says for or against um, being a postdoc versus having a uh, faculty job in terms of getting research funding. It really depends on the work that you do. Yeah, I would agree. I, I turned down a few postdocs to go straight into a uh, faculty uh, tenure track slot when I came out about 40 years ago, uh, came out of uh, my doctoral program. And, uh, you know, I was told the same thing that uh, really you have to prioritize being a postdoc first. Uh, you know, I just think it depends on the circumstances uh, and where you're at. Um, and, you know, you can wind up uh, getting a, a postdoc and then working real hard to find a, a faculty position. Um, you may not be able to very easily. Uh, uh, in a tight market, uh, from my point of view, if you can get into the tenure track, uh, 
a long haul, that's what you wanted to do in the first place anyway. So uh, I would think about uh, uh, trying to prioritize what you want out of this. Uh, and then secondly, find a place, you know, where uh, you like to be. Uh, there are a lot of places where you can get into a tenure track uh, situation and be surrounded by people that are very supportive to an early career person or who eat you alive. So uh, uh, there's no magic formula. Uh, it'll depend on the specific circumstances. Another question um, looked at uh, discussing how to say no and then to um, how for a good, um, let's see, what are some um, strategies that students and junior faculty can use to navigate that? I should defer to my other colleagues since I'm bad at that, but I, have to, I, I can share one comment. Just um, one of our council members once said, uh, it, it's not a question of um, how to keep all the balls in the air. It's the question of knowing which balls it's okay to drop. And it's related to the saying, it's better to not have the ball in your hands in the first place in some cases. Um, and, uh, but I think that it's, it's clear that we can't handle in many cases the many responsibilities that are on our plate. And I, from people I know both within NIH and also in the academic field, this doesn't seem to be changing. I think uh, technology has made us more accessible for more things all the time. Um, so it feels like we're juggling more and more, but it, it doesn't feel sustainable. I've struggled with saying no. Um, and I think the Cameron's points about the mission and purpose are really excellent um, guideposts for that. Because if you don't feel like the activity definitely serves one of your priorities, but you're just doing it because okay, you're the person that's been selected for it. It may not be worth the time because what is it going to require that you give up for something that's more important? Yeah, I, I remember going to my advisor's office in graduate school, Roy Lackman, a great advisor, and I was suggesting a, a research project and he thought for about 30 seconds and then he said, I've got four really good research programs left in me. That's not one of them. And at the time I was disappointed, but I have realized over time that he was uh, sharing a really good piece of wisdom. And, and you're right, it's about looking at what you're saying yes to uh, from a larger perspective, from the point of view of a mission, from the point of view of, of is this worth the investment of my time? What's the potential payoff uh, in terms of quality outcomes? Uh, or is this just something I'm doing to to be a nice person who says yes to everybody? And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's it's about it's about the 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 vision um, uh, and the mission uh, dictating uh, decisions on a daily basis. And this is Teresa, and I do tend to say um, yes a lot because I like things that change up and do, to do different things all the time. I don't like routines. However, what I've learned over the years is that, and this is certainly true in advocacy and <coughs> lobbying, but I think it would be applicable wherever you are, is that instead of saying no, you know, you, or but, you would say yes and. And so what you would do is look and see, what is it that they're asking of me? Can I morph that into something that's important to what I'm doing? So could I say, geez, that sounds great, and could we do this together? And so trying to sort of merge the response so that, and that you can tell, I just really hate to say no. <laughs> so probably that was a question for me, but I do sometimes try to convert it to my own purposes. <laughs> right, thank you. And we have another question from Raina. We hear publish or die in academia. So how do you manage meeting the time consuming but necessary publishing demand but also make sure you are actively helping everyday people and remaining passionate about your work and why you are there. In other words, serving your community, passion, and meeting academic needs. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. You're looking at, you know, how do you balance uh, these uh, sometimes so, uh, what can be conflicting uh, motivations. Um, the first rule of any system is you have to survive. 
And so uh, if you don't survive, you can't do good. Uh, if your, your goal is to survive in academia and publication is uh, the key to being able to do that, then um, uh, certainly you have to throw a lot of time and energy at that. I would, however, uh, suggest that if you can find a way to publish about uh, the work that you are doing that's meaningful, if you can find a way to, to incorporate the work that you're doing uh, as, a, as an instructor or uh, out in the community uh, uh, into um, uh, publications that would be viewed uh, positively by the people on the promotion and tenure committee, uh, then you can shift things around or morph them, as you've heard before, uh, into something that can serve a dual purpose. And that may be like the ideal strategy. Uh, rather than saying, okay, I just have to give up this in order to be able to survive. Okay. Nicole's question relates to work-life balance. Do you have any recommendation how to balance professional commitments with personal commitments and life in general? So this is Liz. I, I think that, you know, it's we're at a time when it's really important to change the whole conversation around this and I think they're just there are two things I think one is um, being highly attuned to everyone's need for work-life balance uh, and speaking up for factors that um, are creating imbalance in the workplace so that you're sure that they can be recognized but I think it's also important I think it was Cameron talking earlier about picking a place to work where you see that there is um, respect for work-life balance in the leadership, in the way people are modeling how they're living their lives. I'm not saying that everybody's actually achieving it, but that people are doing what they can to uh, accommodate, you know, families with children or families with adult caregiving needs, um, scheduling meetings that are appropriately timed so that everybody who needs to be there can be there. Um, because I think workplaces play a huge role in that. So having good um, mentors or sponsors uh, where you get the sense that, that uh, this is how this organization works is key. And I think as we go up in the, the ladder and move into positions of management, I think we need to also be highly attuned to those things ourselves. It's always a challenge, but I think it's important to be in an environment that's going to be supportive of those concerns. And uh, just to give you an example of a policy that helps with work-life balance, AARP a few years ago started a caregiving leave pool. So each of us gets, um, I think it's 14 days of caregiving leave on top of our um, normal vacation at sick. So we're pushing for those policies across the country. And I think, um, I believe that those types of policies are going to become more important for businesses and institutions to offer. And I think that will help all of us with uh, some part of work-life balance. Great. Another question is, thinking about transition from PhD to postdoc, it seems that flexibility and not being a clone from our advisors are key elements. But others might argue that it is important to keep a concrete and logic pathway. I would like to hear more about the importance of flexibility and adaptability for doc, postdoc, and early career. I was fortunate. I was fortunate that my advisor pushed for uh, none of his uh, doctoral students to to be clones. Um, so he made sure that we would. Uh, take coursework in areas way outside of his area of expertise uh, and in a variety of different areas uh, so that we would be able to uh, adjust uh, accordingly. Um, you can try to uh, uh, have a very narrow focus for your career. Um, that's like a person moves into assisted living with the idea that uh, they'll never change, uh, uh, come back back in, in four years and everybody's changed. Uh, uh, it's just going to happen. Uh, you, you can try to prevent it. It's just going to happen. It's like aging. It's just going to happen. Change is going to happen. You have to, you can either prepare for it or not. And so 
uh, I'd rather be proactive on this. Uh, I think if you look at the trajectories of, uh, of our speakers here with uh, 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 Liz and with uh, Teresa and myself, uh, we may not have planned for the radical nature uh, and the multiplicity of changes, but uh, uh, that happened. I think we'd all have to say we're happy for that. So, uh, uh, yeah, when it comes to being rigid in terms of a career path, uh, let it go. The other thing I would say is that, you know, if you look at just what are, if you look at uh, NIH funding opportunities for postdoc training or K training, what they're really asking for is, somebody's coming with some set of skills and then they're going to join up with some mentor with a different set of skills so that you can add to your toolbox and that by you being who you are, adding to your toolbox, you're becoming a unique sort of entity that's gonna have the independence to pursue a different track than your mentor. And it's those types of, of postdoc applicants or K applicants who succeed. If you just do the same thing that's already being done, it tends not to look as uh, creative or promising from a funding you know, from a funding mechanism perspective. And I think probably from a career perspective too. So people who are putting together things and getting from each of their mentors something that adds to their own individuality uh, tend to be the ones who maybe have the most successful careers, and um, at least from, a, from an NIH perspective. Any last parting point of views that you would like to share? Um, I wanted to share something that I didn't get to in my presentation because I was long-winded, which is um, <laughs> people to please look up if you're interested. ARP has established a global council on brain health. And you just have to Google the ARP Global Council on Brain Health. And what we're trying to do is make all of the research, evidence-based research, to be accessible to the public, to our members. And um, in addition, we established, AARP did, a dementia discovery fund. We put $60 million this uh, in the last year or so into a dementia discovery fund. And because a lot of you are researchers, I thought you'd be interested in looking at um, the practical application of what you're uh, learning and how we're using it to help people be healthier. Okay. So what was that global name again? Could global you Council on Brain Health and the Dementia Discovery Fund. And the Dementia Discovery Fund. One, one other thought I had that sort of just I love this this webinar and the opportunity to be part of it. When I was in grad school uh, and undergrad, I mean, I just nobody ever talked about alternative career paths to us. Um, you, you know, when I was a kid in school, I wanted to be a school teacher. When I went to college, I wanted to be a college professor. When I started doing graduate school, I wanted to be a researcher at a university. It was just the only thing I ever thought of and I thought was expected of me. And I didn't really have any models for how to think outside of that box. And, you know, as I went through um, my postdoc and saw many people taking off in different directions and then got into the aging field and saw many people in really interesting careers outside of academia, that whole world opened up to me. But I think it's important to be exposed to that early on because for me, it was a real identity <laughs> challenge shifting out of that research track at first and the little um, you know, I felt a little unsure of myself and of my uh, identity and my decisions. I think it's been a great decision and it fits perfectly with who I am and what I'm interested in, but I wasn't really prepared for that, I would say. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the presenters. Camera, Teresa, and Lisa, as well as everybody who put this webinar together. The links to the webinar recording and related materials will be distributed to our, re our re re registrants. And we encourage you to complete our webinar evaluation, which will be sent to, v to you via email today. So we really encourage you to actually take the time to fill out the, the evaluation that helps us plan other future programs, as well as keep us on the breast of handing things in a very effective way. Thank you so much and have a good day.
Bye for now.